coronavirus presents a public health emergency in the United States. that this is not martial law. Today, the World Health Organization officially announced that this is a global pandemic. In the year 2020, the world was struck by catastrophic events. Riots broke out in big cities, and locusts covered the plains of Africa. It seemed very much like a story from the Bible, one which started near the end of 2019, when a coronavirus identified as COVID-19, contaminated a wet market in Wuhan, spreading through China. Claims that the virus leaked from a regional laboratory sparked independent investigations by local reporters. On January 31st, 2020, President Trump and his administration made the executive decision to deny entry into the United States to foreign nationals who had traveled to China in the past 14 days. This travel ban delayed the arrival of the virus to the United States from China, but it could not be contained. Before long, the virus spread across the globe like wildfire. The world was locked down forcing everyone deemed non-essential to remain in their homes. What COVID to me has revealed is the sense of hopelessness that as a world we have been living under. And it's just blossoming and exposing itself when you are faced with quarantines and isolation. And now I am only left with my thoughts and I'm left with my perspective. But I see it. I see it as a, a retaliation against a life that I feel has done me wrong. And no matter how you frame it, no matter what you're trying to do, no matter who you're trying to attack, you're still reaching out for something that's tangible when this is not tangible. This is not something that you can touch. And how people abuse others is because that's the closest way I can make you hurt like I'm hurting. And I think that's, I think that's the greatest pandemic of our society, is how I am hurting and I need you to feel my pain. Dear fellow citizens, everyone in Bavaria is currently restricted from public areas and confined to their home premises. Stay at home. Son el único sustento que hay para, para comer y ahorita no hay trabajo. Empezamos a partir del lunes. Las, la semana pasada iniciamos con, con to, toda la intervención de cómo podemos este, cuidar a los chavos, cómo les podemos informar y al mismo tiempo cómo nosotros nos podemos este, cuidar. Entonces fue un, una semana entera de planeación y a partir de este lunes empezamos a, a salir a las calles. Sobre todo porque el día de ayer 
eh, por disposición federal se ordenó cerrar algunos hoteles, bueno, más bien mayoritariamente toda, todos los hoteles de la Ciudad de México y las trabajadoras fueron desalojadas de los hoteles y no tenían un lugar a donde llegar. Fears of a new worldwide Great Depression began to rise. Suicide rates increased dramatically in adults as well as children due to fear and prolonged isolation. Hope began to fade. I had uh, been involved with the response to SARS, the first SARS. And uh, I thought, okay, this reminds me of that. And in that situation, they quarantined uh, the cities and they were able to contain it. So early on, I was really hopeful that they would be able to contain it. The difference with this SARS was that it apparently had started uh, flowing during that whole Chinese you know, New Year, or the Chinese time of, of heavy travel, and they didn't lock it down. So uh, this really, the genie got out of the bottle early that we weren't aware of that yet. I had heard about this weird atypical pneumonia that was being seen um, kind of out of the country that we didn't really know what was going on with it. We couldn't really do anything about it. It was hitting a lot of people hard. Um, and that was when I kind of figured that something was coming our way. At first, I, I guess our first reaction was that, well, this is a serious flu pandemic or this is a, uh, a new super bug that is kind of hitting, you know, but then as it became more of a global uh, impact, there was definitely something that was happening. Uh, we began to recognize that, okay, we cannot treat this as just simply, simply something that might come. This is definitely going to hit our area. So what are we going to do to prepare and to manage, you know, any of the potential impact this could have? To unleash the full power of the federal government in this effort today, I am officially declaring a national emergency. So then it progressed and it left China. And I thought, oh boy, this is still, if they've done good tracing, maybe they can lock down those individuals, you know, and, and it won't be too bad. Uh, and then when I, I remember sometime in late, I think it was the last few days of February, um, when we hit 17 countries with uh, COVID, And that's when I thought, that's it. This is, this is going to be big. In China, citizens were not only locked down, but silenced. On December 30th, 2019, Dr. Li Wenliang in Wuhan warned his medical school contacts about seven patients with an unknown virus. That same day, the Health Commission released a statement dictating that organizations or individuals were not allowed to release treatment information to the public without authorization. Dr. Wen Liang was summoned by the police and informed that his warning was illegal and had severely disturbed the social order. After his release, Dr. Wen Liang unknowingly treated an infected woman resulting in his hospitalization with the coronavirus. From his bed, he used social media to expose the lies of the Chinese government and their claims of no human-to-human -human transmission and no risk to health workers. Dr. Wen Liang passed away in his hospital bed a month after becoming infected. After Dr. Wen Liang's death, Several journalists and activists openly challenged the misinformation about the coronavirus. One by one, these activists were arrested. On January 24th, the day before the Wuhan lockdown, journalist and political activist Chen Qiuxi entered the city. Hello, Chen Qiuxi. 现在是1月24号大年三十晚上10点多 
。那么来这儿以后，我会用我的镜头来亲自见证和记录武汉这次防灾检疫过程当中所发生的真实情况，并且愿意把武汉人民的心声传递出去。虽然我曾经因为报道香港事件被中国的网络全网封杀了，我们今年的疫情堪比零三年的非典。而两次疫情的爆炸都是因为对于事实的隐瞒，对于信息的封锁。我们不能一错再错了，我们至少可以把信息传递出去。只要我们让信息跑得比病毒快，这一仗我们就能打赢。即便在过去几年，中国政府说了太多耀武扬威的话，但是那并不能代表中国人民的心声。即便我们都知道，就算你们帮助中国度过了这次难关，中国政府也会继续骂你们是西方敌对势力。但是没办法，中国政府就是这个德行。可是十几亿中国人民是无辜的，这片土地上的生灵已经承受了太多的苦难，是时候做出改变了，请你们本着人道主义的情感，帮帮中国，帮帮武汉。It's no secret that China stopped U.S. investigators from coming in.、Um, it was of paramount importance that we got into China、um, in an expedited fashion, and, and that didn't happen. The challenge we had as a church was not to let it become something that was divisive.、Uh, that was a part where we needed to recognize pretty quickly. That there is a lot of emotions attached to this. There's a lot of fear. There is a lot of uncertainty in the medical community as much as in、uh, the, the spiritual community. So the national disaster medical system is that the federal、uh, teams that go out for disasters, they have a public health service that responds to to usually、uh, infectious disease, but、um, with COVID, we ended up with so much kind of overwhelming need. That we were responding for the disease of COVID itself, and、uh, initially that first response, the first big cases that were kind of imported into the United States, were、uh, off the cruise ships. So、uh, the federal government was asked to step in and kind of work out how we were going to、uh, dock those cruise ships that were known to have outbreaks. So they activated the uh, uh, national disaster medical system, and us in coordination with. Public health officials,、uh, we opened up centers to be able to manage COVID patients. I worked in Daytona when Ebola was a huge scare,、um, and as the local public hospital for that area,、um, we were where those cases would have come, <laughs> especially because Daytona does have an international airport. So for me, it was less overwhelming than it was for a lot of our new nurses we had at the time. Um, but it was definitely different than anything that I had dealt with before and since. Like, still now, COVID is the weirdest thing and one of the worst things I've seen. And I've been a nurse for six years. So back when everything first shut down,、um, that's when our school was shut down. My lacrosse season was taken away.、Um, everything was kind of you know being shut down originally in the first place. And one of the few things I had left to do was flight training, and I wanted to keep doing my flight training. And also at the same time, even though my school was shut down, my school was sending emails about, you know, hey, even though we're away from each other,、um, we still want you guys to find ways to contribute to community service because community service is a big part of what we want to do as a school, and it's a big part of our school identity. And so I was talking with my dad, and we wanted to come up with a way to combine community service and also my flight training. And then we came up with Operation SOS, where we deliver these flight supplies. So it ended up being a great way to combine community service,、um, keep my flight training going, and help out with the ongoing pandemic at the time. TJ has excelled tremendously as a pilot.、Um, one of the things that、uh, we look for as instructors are、um, decision making skills、um, or aeronautical decision making. And Because of this unique opportunity, going into more challenging airports,、uh, a lot of considerations and planning、uh, is involved, and TJ has just mastered that.、Um, and that's one of the things that we look for that make a great pilot, and he's just mastered that completely. 也就是大年初一，我到这个武汉市中心医院的发热门诊来看一看，因为昨天晚上应该是有一些人是在这个医院里面过的春节，不知道这会儿能不能遇到他们。这是武汉市急救中心姑嫂路急救站，急救站里边我们就不进去了，别打扰人家工作。急诊的门口，垃圾堆上扔的全都是口罩，还有废弃的防护服。现在差不多是凌晨两点钟，然后
，里面依然很忙碌。好多病人都是在这个外边在接受治疗，在打一些针，医护人员全都是穿着这样的防护服的。这边就是发热门诊了，这个是急诊室。哎，我现在不好意思去打扰人家，看样子是挺忙碌的。这几个应该是比较重的病人，都在打针。地上呢还有一团呕吐物，我不知道是什么时候吐的，一直都没被清理过。我也不知道为什么最近好像是咳嗽的人越来越多，发热的人越来越多。The big thing we tried to do in our church was to not treat this as the new form of leprosy. That if you received a COVID diagnosis, that you were ostracized and you were、uh, kind of put into this awkward position of, you know, well is. Is something wrong with me, and how do I treat others and people around me? We really tried to、uh, distill that very quickly. That listen, it's really important. We do know so that we can respond, and at the same time, we want to care for you. That means if you're shut in, you're quarantined. How can we give you resources? Can we bring meals to you? Can we drop something off on your your front porch?、Uh, you know, can we take care of this business that you need us to do because you're just not able to get out? So、uh, really, our church responded to each other in that way, and I think it distilled a lot of the unease about a diagnosis because none of us, at that early stage, we didn't know what does that mean. You know, is this a, is this truly a death sentence? Is this, you know, what what does this look like? At the time I was deployed to、uh, Miramar、uh, Naval Air Station,、um, there was, we really didn't have an outbreak yet here in, in the California. So、um, this was to me, it was an opportunity to get that first hands-on experience and figure this out. You know what what it actually looks like because you know anytime you do anything, any process for the first time, it looks good on paper. Okay, we're going to wear masks, we're going to wear gowns and gloves, we're going to wear face shields. But what does it look like to walk into a patient's room with all that gear on? And then how do you walk out and get it off properly? And and then how do you get enough supply for everyone to use? And How do you go through your day transitioning from one duty to the next duty with all that equipment and, and everything else changing how you do it? So、um, I would say that that in this case, being deployed on that uh, on that uh, mission down in Miramar really helped set me up to understand、uh, a lot of the pitfalls we were going to run into here at Mission Hospital. Two weeks later, now. The, that had been transitioned over the point where the state now went from an open state to a lockdown state. While I was gone, I got here, and our administration have all gone through training on incident command structure, but not many of them have actually put it into place、uh, in a real world situation. So,、um, being able to kind of participate on that level here at, at home, and then you know help organize the incident command. I think really helped because there was a lot of、um, lacking information、uh, just across the board,、uh, misinformation,、uh, you know, and then communication breakdowns as far as supplies and equipment. You know, norm. There's a normal process. For example, you order supplies. We know that they take a week to get here. We plan that for that, and then we use them. Well, with COVID, it disrupted all of that. So we would put in an order for supplies. We would expect them a week later, and they wouldn't come for a month. So all of a sudden, communication that went out to our our healthcare workers wasn't necessarily accurate because it was based on you know business as usual, and this was definitely not business as usual anymore. Some of it is the helplessness. There's there's nothing that you can do about COVID. There's you can manage the symptoms, and really really hope like heck that it's not going to go south, but. It's really likely that your patients are going to go from being fairly stable in the morning to like potentially ICU intubated by the end of your shift, and you never really know like where it's going to happen or when it's going to happen or if they're going to get better or not. And I think that was the the worst part is throwing everything we had at it and not being able to do anything about it, anyways. We reach out to these small rural hospitals that aren't getting a lot of attention and receiving the same medical supplies as their big city hospital counterparts, and so these hospitals service miles and miles of land, 
and they service entire communities, but they're very underappreciated because they're in these small rural towns. And so going out to them and delivering them uh, tier one PPEs and also ventilator supplies so that they can keep their hospital um, fully supplied so they can continue their fight against the coronavirus in these areas. A lot of the resources were uh, being funneled towards the larger population centers. Um, knowing that the uh, virus was spreading, it was real important that we get these resources to the rural hospitals and quickly. These rural hospitals have been devastated, uh, not just by uh, coronavirus, but also before uh, rural hospitals have been shutting down like at a rate never seen before across the country. And then now with the pandemic, it's just even more of a financial burden and it just makes everything more difficult. And supplies are stretched really thin. And I know one delivery I made to West Virginia, it was going to supply them for an entire month. Um, it was going to extend their supplies until the end of the year. And I delivered at the beginning of December. And so um, just being able to extend their supplies and these hospitals are like rationing out the PPEs that they have. They're being very careful with how much they use. And when we talk to supplies managers, they talk about how little they have in stock and how like much our um, supply gift will help them. This is all TJ's idea. Uh, he discussed it with his father and then um, in turn discussed it with me. Um, and I always say this, it was just one of those moments where, you know, uh, a young man comes up with an idea like this, you're just in awe, you know, it, it kind of takes you back. At the beginning of the pandemic, um, I was part of the group that was just with like the surgical masks and stuff, even in COVID patients rooms that were still contagious and we didn't have the negative pressure. So um, we were kind of a, a group that was at a little higher risk looking back. Um, than I think now people are in the healthcare field because now, you know, we have the N95s that we're able to have easily at our disposal. And we have gowns that we don't have to reuse every time we come in and out of the room. We can actually throw them away. Um, so I think the majority of the people that I knew who got sick, who I worked with directly, was a matter of we didn't have the knowledge and the resources kind of widespread at the time to give them the best tools to not get sick. These are all disposable. And I'm supposed to walk in a patient's room and put this on as I walk in and take it off as I walk out. But now we're wearing the same mask through the whole day. Uh, and the way we get away with that in a patient's room is we wear a face shield. So theoretically, if it's a droplet spread, the droplets are landing on the face shield and not on the mask. And then the shield is cleanable, and so we clean our shield afterwards. So um, that's uh, extended use, and it's something that we had to do. Um, but yeah, there, was, there were problems with supplies. There were problems with the fact that um, a lot of the masks were not the quality that we need. Uh, when you're talking about an N95, it's different. This is more of a shield. It stops the droplets from hitting my face. It's not meant to stop air from going around the sides here. So um, uh, an N95 and those type of masks are a filtration system. They're not supposed to allow air to go around the sides. I know for a fact we had a lady that lost uh, her job through the midst of some of those early days and we worked hard and connecting her with people and connections and, and sometimes those didn't pan out but it led her to other opportunities and other places so it was it was a multi-tiered level of just interaction with people trying to help them in their moment of life. So the pandemic brought about things. The struggle with the pandemic was the normal things that you would do, you just couldn't do. You weren't allowed to do them, you know, under the isolation and the quarantines and everything else. And uh, so those were aspects of that. Uh, I remember early on um, sitting in a car with somebody in a parking lot because their loved one is in there and they can't go in and see them. You know, sitting on a phone with somebody when they're waiting for three hours for test results because they can't go in and be with their spouse or something like that. It's just a lot of that, just helping people not feel abandoned and isolated. Early on, people asked me about, well, you don't know anything about this virus. How are you going to deal with this? You don't know. You don't know what to do. And I pushed back against that saying, you know, I mean, infection prevention is literally our business. We do this all day long. This hospital houses the worst infections in the community, that's why they end up hospitalized. And uh, every day we manage infectious disease and make sure it doesn't spread. So that was just, we just put our normal infection prevention principles in place and we had just had to ensure that people were following what those principles were.
呃，我的名字已经彻底成为敏感词，只要带“陈旧史”三个字带 C Q S， 带我这张脸，在微信上都传播不了。已经有很多人跟我说，我在武汉的视频只要通过微信传播，连号都会封掉，因为最近在中国微信上的谣言确实很多。所以这条视频你看看就好了，我不建议你往微信上传，因为你传到微信上，你的号就会被炸。我已经炸了一个微信号，和很多人都失去联系了。今天是三十号，我来说一说前两天我的经历哈、啊。呃，刚来武汉那两天，走访了武汉中心医院，大年三十那天，后来去了武汉第十一医院，去了两次，去了武汉的超市，去给跟志愿者一起去捐赠一些物资给协和医院，去了火神山工地现场，这是在之前。昨天二十九号。我先是去了武汉第五人民医院，就是传说中有多少名医生倒下的地方，但是我没有能力说，你不可能，我直接问医生，呃，你们有没有同事倒下？医生也很忙，我也不可能采访到医院的领导，医院的领导和医生都不会接受采访的，因为我听到的信息是，武汉所有的医疗人员全部接到通知，不允许接受采访。甚至有的医院是医生手机要上缴，不允许传播信息。现在我们就知道，最开始抓那八个人，好像全都是医生，在他们的医疗工作群当中讨论这个疫情的问题。It's been disappointing, you know, I think globally and here because,、um, again, China、uh, looks like they didn't really、uh, take this as aggressively and seriously as they could have initially.、Uh, and ideally, a virus like this you want to contain right at the source, especially having identified a unique virus causing Uh, the, this cluster of pneumonias—that's、uh, when you want to really jump on this and, and shut it down.、Um, and then around the world, it, you know,、uh, it showed the weaknesses in, in the healthcare system across the world. I think a lot of Americans who haven't traveled to see other health systems have an impression that we have the best health system in the world, and that's true across the the top crust, like the latest, greatest, the emerging science. But it's you know, as far as the day-to-day -day medical care. Many other uh, uh, places have equal or even better healthcare than we do. The problem was that early on we didn't know how to how to treat this disease very well.、Um, we were treating it, and, we, and to some extent, it still is a pneumonia. It's a you know a lung infection, but the reality is it's a vascular infection. The way it attacks the body is really a, its effect on、uh, blood vessels and then subsequent blood clots that form and things like that. So. When we addressed early on just the pulmonary side of things, people didn't do very well. Have you seen anything at this point that gives you a high degree of confidence that the Wuhan Institute of Virology was the origin of this virus? Yes, I have. Yes, I have. And I think that the World Health Organization should be ashamed of themselves because they're like the public relations agency for China, and this country pays them almost five hundred million dollars a year. And China pays them thirty-eight million dollars a year, and、uh, whether it's a lot or more, it doesn't matter. It's still they shouldn't be making excuses when people make horrible mistakes, especially mistakes that are causing hundreds of thousands of people around the world to die. I think the World Health Organization should be ashamed of themselves. From a political side, I think we all had questions. Where did this come from? You know, how did this all of a sudden hit the world like it did and take it by storm, literally? And And I think the the sense of origin and the origination, I think, in all of our minds was, where is that information? Where is it coming from? How do we know for certain? I think once it got out and once it traveled, there really was no stopping it. Once it established a foothold in China, however it got wherever it got to begin with, that was about the end. Like that, it, there was no. Real chance, I think, that we had of stopping it, and I don't know if by the time it got here and really became well known that that was the goal anymore. I think the goal at that point was to try and prevent overwhelming hospital systems and our healthcare system,、um, which ended up happening anyways because we were definitely overwhelmed. Try and、uh, you know push back. Listen to what the scientists are talking about. I think Dr. Fauci has now got a cult following.、Um, he probably has a lot of haters as well. 
You have to really learn to be uh, critical of your sources of information and look at the source and look at if they, are they really qualified to give these opinions. Not everybody with an MD behind their name is necessarily qualified to give you the latest, greatest opinion on COVID. Yo 那有的病人就是我咳嗽几天了里边长椅上躺的是人走廊里夹的是床厕所门口夹的都是床他说我要不是陪我哥来看病我绝对不敢上这儿来就是你怎么敢上这地方来然后进去之前浑身消毒出来以后浑身消毒What I find very interesting about COVID and what it has done as a people is how oxymoronic we are in many ways how we value life only in crisis moments but then treat others as wasted goods in times when I don't see uh, a response like COVID has caused me to respond to you know, why are we so concerned with hospital rates and mortality rates and death rates when in reality we treat the human race as simply animalistic and we are just basically the survival of the fittest? It just seems to me that our philosophy of living sounds very contradictory when we come to a place where now COVID challenges everything that I say is the value of living. Our patients that get intubated, it's a really big question mark on if they're ever going to get extubated. And it's a very, very, very long road. Whether you come to the end of that road as a patient who does better and gets exubated and is able to transition to, you know, kind of post COVID into long COVID, or if you're somebody who doesn't and you transition to like a withdrawal of care and a compassionate wean where we focus more on comfort than on life-saving measures. Um, but we would, it's not standard to keep people intubated for a terribly long time. I'm talking a couple weeks, and then we're talking about like a trach and more long-term solutions. The instability of COVID patients has us keeping them intubated for 20 days, 30 days, like excessively long periods because they're so unstable. And a lot of times our biggest fight is keeping people from having to get intubated because usually once we're at that point, you're so far gone that it's not likely that you're ever gonna get extubated. I do remember thinking about the ventilator issue in that first week in March when we were down in San Diego, I had a 90 year old gentleman who, who came down with COVID and uh, collapsed, had very low oxygen levels. He's one of the first people I sent off to a local intensive care unit to be cared for. Uh, I found out later uh, when I called to ask how he's doing that he had a do not resuscitate order and did not want to be put on a ventilator. So we tried to arrange to have his wife go see him and got her out to the hospital to see him because I thought for sure he would pass away. And uh, he avoided being on a ventilator and even at age 90, he ended up surviving. Uh, so that was my first thought that, wait a second, you know, a 90 year old that was supposed to die didn't go on the ventilator and he survived. Meanwhile, we've got, we're putting 50, 60 year olds that really should survive on a ventilator and they're dying. So uh, that shows you that 
uh, following kind of our standard routine, which you look at the CAT scan, you look at the x-ray, we were seeing what we call acute respiratory distress syndrome, or ARDS. And when we see that, we know that person is going to end up on a ventilator. And so we, we lean in that direction early because we know if we let their oxygen level drop too low, um, your organs start to fail, and now you have got multiple problems. So um, that's why early on, a lot of people would lean towards early oxygen, early ventilation, and that was shown later on to be uh, you know, exactly incorrect, that the, the pressures of the ventilation uh, and maybe even the high oxygen levels do more damage than good. This is this patient. This patient is also 40 years old, and she's crying. She's crying in front of me, and she's crying in front of me. 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 I've been crying for a week. 我现在我弟弟有点发烧，我丈娘也发烧，就是春节前一天封城前一两天，我跟我家人一起吃的饭，我去我丈母娘家一起吃的饭，我还跟我几个同学一起打的麻将，我那两天接触的人都有十来个，如果我确诊了，那十几个人怎么办？我们一家都全完了。这就是那个病人亲口跟我说的。I just have to get up. I just have to get through this twelve hours. And know that not everybody on my floor today is going to make it through this shift. That somebody will die today, and that is something that you just have to to deal with. Is that at least one person every shift is going to die, and it really sucks <laughs> because you'd go home and you'd come back and you would know. That at least one other person wouldn't be there the next time you walked in, and it could have been somebody that you had talked to three days before and found out about their grandkids, or talked to them about their dog, or you know some of the people that you had worked with before, and they may not be there, and that really sucked. But it just became a 12-hour game: wake up, make it through 12 hours, go home. Wake up, make it through 12 hours, and go home. I think if the outbreak、uh, overwhelmed us even more, like say the rest of the world looked like New York City, I think New York City is a great kind of、uh, experiment in what does it look like when the virus runs out of control. I would imagine that、uh, they were financially much more impacted than some of the places where lockdowns slowed the spread. As we gather today, our country. Is at war with an invisible enemy. We are marshaling the full power of the American nation, economic, scientific, medical, and military, to vanquish the virus, and we will do that. Today, I'm here to express my profound gratitude to the dedicated service members who will soon be on the front lines of this fight. In a few moments, the crew of the Navy hospital ship USNS Comfort will embark for New York City, where they will join the ranks of tens of thousands of amazing doctors, nurses, and medical professionals who are battling to save American lives. The Comfort sister ship on the West Coast, the USNS Mercy, arrived ahead of schedule substantially. In port yesterday, it's performing a similar mission for the people of Los Angeles and the people of California. Among the sailors departing today are some of the finest doctors, nurses, technicians, orderlies, and medical staff anywhere in the world. These are true professionals, and no one performs better under pressure when lives are on the line. These are incredible people. With the courage of our doctors and nurses, with the skill of our scientists and innovators, with the determination of the American people, and with the grace of God, we will win this war, and we will win this war quickly, with as little death as possible. The battle in which we're now engaged has inflicted many hardships on our nation and our families. At this moment, there are 151 countries throughout the world that are under attack by this horrible, invisible enemy. We are one family bound together by love and loyalty. I cannot be more thankful to 
the American people, and I can say this, and I can say this from the bottom of my heart, I am very proud to be your president. Thank you very much, and God bless you all. Thank you. Thank you very much. My understanding was, at least when they were in L.A., what they were saying is they're a non-COVID facility. So they were taking care of all the people with no COVID. And the assumption there is that there wasn't enough capacity in the hospitals to do the non-COVID stuff. But they also weren't doing elective surgeries, which was really the only thing we were canceling here. So we still, because of all the canceled elective surgery, we had plenty of capacity to take care of uh, everything non-COVID as well as COVID. And because we're able to separate the two very effectively, we still could do all our non-COVID. I mean, babies were still being born. People were still having heart attacks. People's gallbladders still needed to come out if they were bad enough. There were certain procedures that we still had to keep doing. Uh, and if anything, we had extra capacity to be able to do all that. So, um, but I would imagine it'd be a different story in New York City where they were overwhelmed. My best friend still lives here in Queens and uh, just to see what this entire city's going through and then how the Navy can come out and support uh, is amazing. We've got such an important mission set in the Navy and the sailors on this ship, whether they're from New York or whether they're from California, they're here to help. So when we arrived here in New York, we were told that we were going to be dealing with non-COVID patients. Shortly after arrival, that changed and we had to adjust. The men, men and women of engineering were asked uh, where we could establish the best boundaries, how we could uh, reduce accidental contact, working closely with leadership, specifically the deck department, we established boundaries, <clears throat> transferred them from the drawings onto the actual doorways, ladder wells, to minimize the accidental contact between patient caregivers working with COVID and, and patient support uh, that have no direct contact with a patient, all of the facility support where my team fits in, so that we would know not to go beyond this point, or when we did, we had to take the appropriate precautions. This mission uh, calls for a lot of teamwork and a lot of resiliency between each other. I currently hold the role as a transport nurse, so while I still have patients on the ICU, I do leave the unit to go bring the patients on the ship. So this requires my coworkers to cover the watch of my patients while I step off the floor to bring on new patients to the unit. There were 20 beds in there, and that's a lot for an ICU. Where back home, there was, there's 12 beds in a normal ICU. So when I saw that walking in the door, I was just like, oh, wow. When this all started happening, where they started closing everything down, my school got shut down uh, for paramedic school. Um, I got about 48 hour notice that they were looking for volunteers. And um, what better way to really keep up my skills and go help uh, a city in need right now. Well, my role as an ICU nurse directly impacts the medical mission. Um, nurses are, have the most hands-on patient care. Uh, you know, physicians make the decisions, but nurses execute those decisions and are at the bedside 24-7. Um, so I would say all the nurses aboard the USNS Comfort provide a, a significant role in the medical mission. As a team, we've had to, for one thing, acquaint ourselves with each other. Um, try to figure out the best way to work fluidly. Considering we, a lot of us have never worked with each other before, they gave us roughly a week to get ready and move out. We try to support each other as best as possible. Everyone's got a different story. Some of my feelings about being here, I think um, it's a, a terrible time for our country, for the, the world as a whole. Um, there's a lot of people suffering in many realms from Obviously, the health and wellness is the biggest crisis, but a lot of people are feeling pain in other ways, whether it's jobs or finances. But being in this environment is also just invigorating. You see the, the true testament to humanity and, and selflessness. You see the, the greatness in people as well here and people coming together to give themselves and, and just help you know, millions of strangers. One of our patients that came in was not really sure where she was at. Um, she was scared. She had uh, a bad appendix, and she was getting some IV treatment for that at a hospital, but was moved to us um, for continuing care. Um, she was an unknown COVID-19, so we placed her in our tent. We explained the process and explained to her that um, we were going to continue to take care of her. 
Um, but we needed to know her COVID-19 status to know and determine where to place her on the ship. Um, she was unaware that um, the ship was here in New York City and um, she was very scared about being positive um, and what was going to happen to her. So I sat down with her and explained everything and um, we found out she, she was negative. So we placed her on the ward that was a negative COVID-19 ward for her to continue to get her IV antibiotics. So then she could hopefully go home soon. And um, she was thrilled to find out she was negative and was pretty tearful, which, you know, is emotional for us too, because we know they're scared. To establish the boundaries we keep referring to, uh, it was a, a team effort where first we had to outline the areas where the doctors and medical people absolutely had to be. And then that eliminated where the rest of us didn't have to be. And by establishing that and taking a boundary up an entire level, we reduced the accidental contact between the caregiver who may have contact with a COVID patient and the support team who had really had no need to come in contact with the patient. And by forcing this distance and taking the guidance that everyone's been talking about, and really washing our hands uh, and wearing masks. Mine is in my pocket right now for the interview, but the deck department led, led by a uh, third officer, uh, Mr. Nate Grant. He met with myself, the captain, the infectious disease team. He was given his instructions. He built the wall, literally. Uh, got two by six lumber, a bunch of screws, erected a barrier, filmed the barrier on both inside and outside with six mil plastic and put signs up. Moving to the next door, where which is already in place, we just sealed over the door with six mil plastic on each side and a sign says emergency use only, uh, don't break the boundary. And people have, to this day have been doing very well in respecting the boundaries that have been established. And I really think that's a lot to do why our numbers within the crew have stayed very, very manageable, very small. Being in New York City on 9-11, it, it led me to join the military. Um, even though I, I uh, enlisted in the Army and spent 11 years as a combat medic, multiple trips to Afghanistan to try to make the people responsible pay for what they did to New York City on 9-11. Um, and, it's, and it's bringing everything full circle, coming back to New York City as a Navy nurse um, in a time when New York City is in a crisis again, and to be able to help the people, the citizens of, of New York City and help them out uh, medically as a Navy nurse, um, since this is my first time back to New York City since I left almost 20 years ago. Uh, I was on a run on top of the ship and I got a text from uh, my father. Uh, he told me my uncle had passed away. So I immediately called the rest of my family to see what was going on just to check how they're holding up. Um, it's been rough because no one can really check on anyone because everyone's in isolation and no one wants to make it worse by like spreading it to family members. So the virus was real in me, but it got even more real when I found out. The mission doesn't stop just because I'm hurting. My sailors expect me to keep my head up, keep doing what I'm doing, so. Staying motivated and, and staying positive is definitely um, a core part of what we're doing right now because you have to keep a positive attitude to keep going. So we are doing whatever we can to motivate each other, remind each other, remind each other of the mission at hand, that we're here for a greater good and that we are prepared for this. We're listening to music, we're ordering food to the hotel when we can to try to just build that camaraderie and build that morale. Um, it's very easy to get down and be exhausted. We've worked weeks and weeks without a day off and we're all very tired, but we know that we're accomplishing good here and the overall mission is to help the people of New York and we're absolutely happy to be here to do that and we're, we're happy to be a part of this mission. I just want to help out in any way that I can and I encourage anybody to help out in any way that they can during these times. Like, I don't think age should be an issue. It doesn't limit me in any way or what I'm doing. Um, I'm just like, one, I saw a need and I wanted to help. And I think that's like the mindset that everyone should approach things. Like your age doesn't like limit what you can do. One excellent example that I have to brag on is actually my veterinarian. Um, they, I had to take my dog into them and I found out that he had all of his staff wearing disposable masks and he was trying to find more or he had them wearing reusable like handmade masks. 
Um, and he was trying to find more because they had taken all of their disposable masks that they had already had in the office and they were stockpiling them for the community. So they had separated them and had stopped using them in their clinical practice so that as the community needed them, they could give them to people. 前两天我不是录了一个视频，我说武汉地当地的民间组织有点这个呃一盘散沙，然后很快就过来打我的脸了。一些民间组织已经联系到我了，他们确实有的是开车帮助运送这个医务人员上下班，有的是负责帮忙搬运卸货，因为全国有那么多物资过来，然后他们负责从车上拿下来再送到医院做这个这些志愿者团队。然后我跟他们加了微信，也要去参加他们的活动。但是我能看到，他们的工作也是很累，而且这些志愿者也是，呃，满腹牢骚，非常不容易。It's just you hear these stories all over the place of how people have just simply stepped up and been consistent, being faithful, just stepping into people's lives and、uh, trying to as best as possible. We have an individual in our church that would just go sit on the front lawn and have a conversation through a screen door and. It's just that sense of not feeling isolated and abandoned and totally ostracized. I think that's been the hardest thing about COVID is that sense of just feeling abandoned. And it's been neat to see how people around the world are just seeking to recognize that sense of we need community. For a while, we weren't allowing any visitors at all, and、uh, you know that tears us all up、um, because we know that part of healing is to have、uh, loved ones around you for support. Um, and so、uh, we, even though it seemed mean and awful that we were turning people away, it ripped us apart just as much as it did the people we were sending away.、Um, so we worked hard to try and get people back in to see their loved ones in a safe manner. So we weren't taking the infection under this roof and you know sending it out into the community,、uh, but also not to put our our caregivers at risk because we were really looking at. Would we have enough nurses or enough doctors if, say, 20% of our staff are out with COVID? And the answer was no. We wouldn't have had enough, and it probably would have happened simultaneously with other hospitals having the same problem. They try their best to stay out of public places, and you know this and the other. And then, like, their grandkid came home and then tested positive, or. You know, they would have a family member who was a healthcare worker who maybe you know. Incidentally, brought it into the home, and so those ones, those ones were always harder emotionally because it was really hard for us to look at them and say, like, I know you did all the right things, and I'm really sorry, but you got sick anyways. Today's COVID, today's Wuhan COVID, is both a blessing and a burden, and more than a burden. They are starting to blur. You, Wen Liang, doctor, they. 发他们的真实声音压制，甚至训诫。后来掩盖不住了，惊慌、愚蠢的、高调的封城，超神，人挤人，车站人挤人，机场人挤人，菜场人挤人，超市人挤人，医院人挤人，有肺炎的。已经有了，没有的感染了。结果超城在他提前八九个小时封城的时候，已经冲出去三十四十万人，这些人冲向了中国，冲向了世界，把病毒带向了周围，带向了全中国。这一切都是他们的愚蠢造成的，他们的愚蠢绝不能由我们来承担，我们必须清算他们。我们的故乡被奴役了，被马列邪教奴役了，我们成了马列的奴隶。病毒的残酷远远比不上暴政的残酷，病毒的根源是暴政，大家一定要认识清楚。只有彻底铲除暴政，才能彻底铲除病毒，大家要清楚这一点。The problem, what I found, is it all comes back to one word, and that's the word authority. Who is the authority of my life? Am I the authority of my life, or is God? And the reaction to that question has to do with, well, who gets to determine my? And here's a word we use, kind of haphazardly, my fate. Who determines my fate?、Uh, and so, 
Is God using coronavirus as a way of setting up something else? I, I would say yes, but is, that's how I perceive it because I see it fitting. I perceive how we're handling this politically across the globe as setting up a lot of things. Uh, I see a lot of tie together, but I may come 30 years from now and realize, wow, I was way off. To me, the bigger question is, is do I see God in the moment? Am I looking for God? Am I focused on him having the authority and the right to do it, if this is what he's choosing to do? Now, do I believe that it's part of the process? Yeah, but I also see it as whether this was a created virus or whether this is truly a, a mutated virus of something that was already existent, it's all part of the fact that it's partly tied to a curse. It's tied to something that is not in the original design, and that's because of sin. And that is part of the battle that we face on a regular basis. When you get into the hospital and you come in and especially because we could tell you, yes, you have COVID, like you have a diagnosis. Um, they want to know what to do. And they look to their physicians and their nurses and the staff in the hospital to be able to tell them, okay, this is the plan. This is the things that we will do that give you the best possible chance for a positive outcome and getting better. And we didn't have that. We still don't really have that. Um, so it was a lot of fear. Um, and it was a lot of fear on part of the staff too, because we didn't really know what we were going to do if we got sick. <laughs> and so beyond like beyond us looking at our patients and they're like, okay, well, what happens next? I don't know. I don't know what happens next. Like we're going to, I guess, figure it out together. Um, and that, that made it really hard for them because instead of being able to have kind of a calm guiding presence in terms of staff, you just kind of had this big question of, okay, what, what are we doing next? What are we trying next? And sometimes it would change from day to day. So even if we had a plan tomorrow, it's not the plan anymore. And there was a lot of, of things that we tried that we had not done before. So it's, it was very hard for patients to have to have staff look at them and say, I don't know, I don't know. In, in all likelihood, just based on prior experience, which isn't necessarily gonna be true for this virus, but the way we see the end to every other uh, disease like this, like measles, mumps, rubella, influenza, is a vaccine. I would imagine that unfortunately there will be some uh, negative impacts of some of the vaccines. And uh, that's unfortunate because those will probably be kind of blown out of the proportion to the benefit uh, eventually or ultimately. But um, you know, that's with, with all medications, with almost everything we give patients, there's a downside. And uh, so I wouldn't expect it to be any different from the vaccine, but I do think that's the ultimate end for this. Uh, there's definitely a potential for this to be like the common cold where it circulates or like oh, many of these other viruses where we get little outbreaks, it circulates uh, and we see it resurface from time to time. So I don't necessarily think that we'll eradicate it from the planet on this first go around. Um, although, like I said, with SARS-1, um, we really don't see any of those cases. Those disappeared for some reason. But you compare that to Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome, which is another uh, SARS virus. And that one still pops up. It's still giving us cases every year. Um, so again, it could go either one of those directions. I think most likely, like most viruses, it's a continuing process. I had 20 year olds die. I had 70 year olds die. I had, I mean, we had everybody. It was all over the place. Fit people too. Like we had young people who were in shape, who were like athletic and things, and they would come in and they would die. And it was like, I didn't understand. We, I still don't understand why some people get really, really sick and others don't. On February 1st, fellow journalist Fang Bin filmed at local hospitals and uploaded the footage from his home in Wuhan. 
After several denials of mass deaths by the Chinese government, Fang finally caught their lie on camera. Later that same day, Fang Bin had a knock at his door. He began recording live. Okay, 如果你跟法律条件我后边是中国的法律和行政力量just when things seemed as though they couldn't get worse. On the night of April 12th, an EF3 tornado tore through Chattanooga, Tennessee. Despite obeying the stay-home order to prevent the spread of the coronavirus, some citizens had nowhere to turn as their homes had been destroyed. If I could say what a bomb scene looked like, that's what it looked like. There is a part, our, our particular facility sit on a, a pretty high, I would call it a knoll, uh, it's a hill, it's a pretty good vantage point, we're up on a hill. And uh, there's a community that is to the east of us that goes up even further. It's called Holly Hills, and there's a, it rises up even more in a geographical structure. And then there, from our vantage point, we're kind of in the middle of that. So uh, I went out into one of our athletic fields, and I was driving a, one of the little vehicles that we had to motorize around on the property. And I just sit, sat there in the vehicle, and I looked out. And this is now a few days after the tornado. 
and it was just a sea of blue tarps everywhere. And roofs, I mean, literally almost on every house, there was a tarp or the house wasn't there anymore. Uh, splinters, debris. We had uh, a property just to the west of us. Uh, it was a small church and pretty much their entire contents was strewn onto our field. Uh, it literally looked like a, a very rough weed eater just went through and chopped up everything. Uh, we, have, uh, a, we had a, a steel structure that was a gymnasium uh, and it, the, the insurance people that worked with us said they had never seen steel mangled like this and they've worked with Katrina and other disasters and it looked like a giant just sat down on top of our, our structures. It was just all mangled and twisted and caved in and it was, it was very overwhelming. The, the, the night that I got there, uh, Don Arnold and I walked into the property because we couldn't drive there. You had to walk in about a mile. And we, we get up there and it's dark, no lights on because all the power is out and we could just see emergency lights and there were emergency vehicles lights going and you see a modicum of what it looked like. But when the daylight hit and the next morning and I walk back up there, it literally takes your breath away because you, you don't realize how vast the destruction was. For us personally, we had 17 structures and 15 of the 17 had to be torn down. So we, we lost a 25 acre campus. We lost the entirety of our campus. It was a global destruction for us. Special people. It's an incredible place, incredible state, a tremendous heart. Already you see people rebuilding. I mean, it took place uh, literally hours ago, a couple of days, and uh, they're already rebuilding. I've never seen it. We were flying over. You see the, the blue roofs going up. That's uh, all over the place. They're just great people. It's a great state, and uh, they have great leadership in this state, and that's why it's working out like it is, but still 25 people at least, and some really very badly hurt, very, very badly hurt. Uh, the mayor was telling me uh, some of the houses came down and they got here right after that happened, and people are walking out of the houses, and you might explain that, what that looked like. It was just, you know, it's a war zone, and it's in the middle of a knot. It's very, uh, very uh, difficult to maneuver that. But the first responders, we can't say enough about the first responders that were here, Went in, you know, they run in when everybody else is running out, and, and they ran in and, and took care of these folks, uh, police and fire and EMS, and, and it, was, it, was, it was an amazing night. We had people that were, they were so disoriented, they were wandering out down the roads and through the fields and the woods, trying to get to, to safety and figure out where they could go, and, and uh, our great group of responders took care of them immediately, and uh, it's, we're so sad. They didn't lost. know what happened. They just all of a sudden they're watching television or something and all of a sudden they're outside walking on the street. Yeah. There was one young boy, I heard he he was taken out of the house and he was. Yes. One minute he's in his house, the next minute he's laying in his yard. Uh, it happened that fast. A couple of blocks away. Yes. Another family was uh, the husband huddled over the, the wife and child and the, and the roof came off and he was sucked out. They were all sucked out of the yard. They survived. So we just got back from Walmart and uh, we are uh, to get batteries and uh, we dodged a bullet last night. We're looking at the uh, whole area's neighborhoods uh, around our area just gone, uh, literally just gone. Uh, churches, the whole, you name it. And uh, so we're going to be honkering down for a bit. Um, I don't know if when power is going to be up in our area, I don't think anytime soon. So, um, prayers for Chattanooga, everybody. I live approximately a mile away from the church campus. And so as a community, my community alone was affected in a mixture of ways. Uh, my house had some shingles ripped off, 
but the house one street over and down a couple was completely first level taken out. So our whole community was affected. In a, and so that night when the power goes out and the storm has blown over and we go outside, and I, I will say one thing that was interesting is COVID did not exist the night of the tornado. Uh, that was completely gone. It was the last thing in our minds and we were more conscious of who got hurt, is everybody okay, what can we do, and what is our response now to helping people really, in many ways, carve out uh, trees falling, power lines down, uh, debris thrown everywhere, families completely uh, upheaval now because parts of their house are completely gone and destroyed. All right, headed to Chattanooga. We had uh, large amounts of support, especially with our internal staff. Uh, that would be our school and uh, church and things like this. All right, made it to uh, Chattanooga. This place, uh, just eerie, man. It just, it just, just like Nashville. Um, waiting, after them are on their way down there, haven't met up with them yet. So I'm just gonna take the chainsaw and start walking, see who I can help. Uh, there's just trees everywhere. So there's definitely gonna be, there's no shortage of trees that need to be cut down, so uh, yeah. We had people trapped in neighborhoods in our own church for probably two or three days, just could not get out. Their roads were completely blocked off, uh, so they could maybe get to the end of their driveway, but they couldn't get out of their communities. And so we sent in teams, several teams, uh, trying to just, they just, I know of two men that just grabbed two chainsaws and just started walking down roads and did that all day long and uh, trying to help people out. So. As far as on the campus itself, we started having people that were coming in just trying to uh, get us access so that we could get back into areas because of the need to salvage as much as we could and uh, not lose those resources. And so we began to organize teams and help with that. And we did. We had people that traveled in uh, from other ministries that sought to help us. And it was really amazing to see the people respond to that. I've had to fly in a lot of severe weather. I mean, that's part of uh, the job when it comes to flying these missions is dealing with weather and kind of like weather management. We were on the ground and it was kind of a split decision whether we should go, maybe we shouldn't go, and we ended up deciding to go. And then as we were going, we were closing in this big thunderstorm while we were flying to the hospital. So we, know, we knew that we, as soon as we landed, we had to drop off and just take off right away because that storm was coming in really quick. So we spent maybe 10 minutes on the ground just giving them the supplies, making sure, making sure they got everything. And then we had to take off again. And on our way home, I mean, the storm was right there on our left side coming home. And if we had spent like another 10 minutes or 15 minutes on the ground there, we would have ended up in that storm. And who knows what, have, what would have happened. You know, I think that um, from a community perspective, that it's definitely, uh, I feel like, you know, every, there's good things and there's bad things, right? Uh, and obviously nobody wants to go through a pandemic. But um, I've seen some good things come out of this pandemic, uh, and it's the, the closeness of the community on multiple different levels. I mean, in my own house, my kids are, have come home from college for a, a period of time and kind of all stuck together as adults, which was an unusual situation uh, for us anyway. And really, it brought our family closer together. I see the neighbors in a different way. We're all you know helping each other a little bit more than we used to type of thing. Within the walls of the hospital, they, uh, I really see a lot more collaboration. And uh, there are other non-COVID issues that we had always been working on, and they seem to kind of stall out a little bit when they had to cross over different departments. But I think because of the collaboration that we created with COVID, it really broke down a lot of barriers. And now uh, we've made huge progress in non-COVID areas uh, because of the community that's developed within the hospital during this time. We first started, we were going to deliver to the seven critical access hospitals in Virginia and then see where to go from there. But that's when we really didn't know how long this was going to take. And now um, I've done 18 or so missions and I don't really see an end to Operation SOS until there's an end to the coronavirus. As long as there's a need out there and as long as I'm able to help, I'm going to go out there and find these hospitals that need help and I'm going to make deliveries to it was surprising to the extent, because of COVID, because of some of these other things, 
how quickly people just laid that aside and said, you know what, this takes precedent. You need help. Uh, I will say, though, the short time I've, I've lived here in Chattanooga, um, it didn't surprise me because of the general attitude. In fact, when I'd asked people that question, I said, oh, no, Chattanooga is going to respond and they're going to step up and our people are going to help each other. And, and that is historically true because of uh, the, the tornado back in 2011. There's been other disasters that have hit in more recent years. And it has been a testament to this community that they really look out for each other and uh, they really step up and help. And they're truly neighborly and kind and they will help uh, until the task is done. Under Operation Warp Speed, we're on track to deliver at least 100 million doses of a vaccine this year and uh, could even be a little bit sooner than what they were originally anticipating, with hundreds of millions more to quickly follow. You know, the acceptance of a vaccine is going to be challenging, but that's not new. That's always the case. So uh, whenever you come up with a new vaccine, uh, there's a certain number of people that have a mistrust of it and won't take it. Uh, and I think the fact that, uh, well, I think it was a smart move to try and accelerate uh, vaccine production and have the government do what they could to knock down those barriers and coordinate. Um, I think it, uh, it did create uh, some level of mistrust that maybe steps are being skipped uh, or that uh, things are being rushed to market. So we have that extra burden to overcome. Uh, this whole event has taught me, again, how little I control and how little I have the ability to fix this and how dependent I am upon other people. I'm amazed at the resources that God has provided to us. People that just came and have offered their services is one thing, but the people we have hired, the people that God has, it has just been an an amazing process. To me, the greatest challenge in all of this is to believe that there is a God that is greater than your crisis and that He will walk with you if you'll let Him. Humility is a front door of some of the greatest experiences of your life. I'm going to Walter Reed Hospital. I think I'm doing very well, but we're going to make sure that things work out. The First Lady is doing very well. So uh, thank you very much. I appreciate it. I will never forget it. Thank you. On October 2nd, United States President Donald Trump contracted the coronavirus and was hospitalized at Walter Reed Medical Center after his oxygen levels dropped and his fever spiked. The president received oxygen doses and extensive treatment while continuing to work under 24-hour supervision. I, I think overall, the, the concept of contracting the virus is like how many of us were at times in our life. Um, I have uh, an acquaintance of mine who I went to college with who is struggling with the COVID right now is probably in his last days. So at the same time, all of my family member has gone through COVID and never really had a trouble. I had a, a cold, basically, I felt like. How that situation, I think what it brought was a concern of succession. What if something does happen? You know, who's next in line? Who's telling me the truth? You know, how do I find answers? And the very people that are leaders and they're struggling and we don't have a clear understanding of is our president, is, is this a death sentence to the primary leadership of our country or is it just a bad cold? At the time, not gonna lie, a lot of us found it funny and ironic. Not that he was ill, but that like, there had been so much from his side of like, this is not that big of a deal. There's really nothing going on, all of that kind of stuff. So for us, it was like a, an ironic funny. Um, and the reports that were coming out about his, you know, general state of health were positive enough that none of us were like, oh my gosh, this is actually like going to be a really big problem for our country. <laughs> um, but it, Definitely was not a lot of sympathy to be passed around for him at the time. Just because of a lot of the information that he was disseminating with, made it very difficult for us to do our jobs. And for us to genuinely help people. Um, and a lot of us lost a lot of sympathy just 
from dealing with these patients every day and from having to deal with the ivermectin and all of that kind of stuff because like people would request it and we're like we're sorry we're not we're not doing that so it did become very difficult for us to have sympathy for him 他们家有四个人确诊，有两个人已经住院了，而他自己一直没有等到床位。他八十四岁的母亲今天上午九点钟已经在家里去世了，现在是下午四点零二分，还在等殡仪馆的车还没有来。呃，他从一月二十三号就
China's going to pay a big price what they've done to the world. This was China's fault.就比如说我自己至少我自己都能验证两个谣言比如说前段时间在中国的朋友圈里天天在传日本向中国派出了一百人的这个医疗队但是外务省的人跟我说怎么可能如果中国政府不发出邀约或者日本政府发出那个请求
or whether the person's just going to walk up and cough in your face and say, I have a bad cough and a fever. So, um, you know, they from day one have been the literal front line of the hospital and uh, have never walked away from their duties. I've never had a nurse here say, I'm not going to work today because it's too dangerous or I'm not going to work. They, they've had concerns for their safety, for sure, but they work through it. Um, so it's incredible. Our intensive care doctors from day one, I mean, unbelievable. Just uh, in constant communication with people all over the world, uh, talking to doctors in Italy, talk, uh, talking to doctors in, uh, in Germany. Uh, we even had conference calls with some of the Chinese doctors. Um, our sister hospitals in Washington, D.C., who had the first patients, we were immediately in communication with them. Uh, in communication with all the, the universities around the country who are sharing their protocols and, uh, and evolving protocols because some were showing promise, but then in the end weren't really helping people that much. And then it would evolve over time. And uh, our critical care doctors just really kept us on the cutting edge of treatment day after day, every single day, even right now. They're still, they meet uh, once a week to discuss the latest evolution in COVID. And we have ever since March, once a week, meet as a, as a committee to discuss the latest evolutions. How are we gonna tweak what we're doing right now to make it that much better? So constantly on the cutting edge of what's going on. Uh, and they're, I mean, they just work tirelessly, it's incredible. One of the challenges that I know our hospital had was we didn't know elective surgeries. If it was not emergent, you weren't having surgery. So it left kind of this really large void for a lot of our surgical staff who now had nothing to do and no way to get paid. So they would pick up on our floors and they would help our respiratory therapists do walking oxes or the nurses would come up and they would help us draw labs and they would be runners for us and would help us with other things that we were maybe overwhelmed with um, because for example, patients were terrible about pulling off their bypass and their high flows. And so a lot of the times our, our float nurses or our, um, the nurses who would come from those other areas, they would kind of be our whack-a-mole essentially is they would watch the monitors and see when someone's O2 was dropping and then they would put their mask on really quickly and go in that room and get their oxygen back on or see why they were desatting, which freed us up a lot more to be able to kind of do cohesive care for people instead of the nurse who was assigned to that patient literally only being able to put oxygen back on them all day. And we did a lot of upskilling with our hospital. So we would take nurses who were from med surge or from a progressive step down unit and they would go and take a couple of classes um, and shadow for a few days and upskill to another area so that they could work directly with the nurses on that floor to be able to help take care of patients, patients that were not necessarily in their normal care group, but that we really needed the staff for. So that was something that was really kind of awesome for us to have and be able to do for each other. Um, and there was, there was a lot of support throughout the hospital for the staff on the COVID units. In the very beginning of the pandemic, if you worked on a COVID unit, you couldn't leave your unit for the whole shift. Um, you were not allowed to go down the cafeteria. You couldn't go anywhere. So once you entered the unit and changed your scrubs, um, you couldn't leave until you changed back out of the green scrubs the hospital was allowing us to wear. So they would send us meals. Um, Granted, it was the same food that the patients were eating and it wasn't always fabulous, but they did send us food so that we wouldn't have to worry about someone who maybe didn't bring their lunch, who wouldn't get a lunch because they can't go down to the cafeteria. So there was a lot of, of support, um, especially among the staff that were kind of at the same level, which was, it made a difference. It made a difference. The people who worked COVID together formed different relationships for sure. The response from all the hospital workers, just the feeling of gratitude that I get when I'm on the ground. You know, I can really feel like how much my deliveries mean to them and they express it to me. And even I can just tell they, I remember when we delivered to hospitals, some of them stay up all night to like make signs for my like welcome party, you could say. And then uh, just seeing how they like cheer for me when I get on the ground and like they all tell me like, thank you so much for bringing this stuff. Like it really means a lot. 
it really is going to help our hospital and just hearing all the gratitude and like the sense that um, they're really appreciative of what I'm doing makes the whole operation SOS process work. This president and this team were in a relentless drive to save lives. We created medicines in record speed. And as the world learned last week, we have come to the beginning of the end of the coronavirus pandemic, and people are already receiving the first safe and effective coronavirus vaccine all across America. Today's achievement is a reminder of America's unlimited potential when we have the will and the courage to pursue ambitious goals. As I've said from the beginning, a vaccine will vanquish the virus and return life back to normal. The pandemic may have begun in China, but we are ending it right here in America. I find that the greatest challenge to comfort is, is then well, what's the foundation of your comfort? If comfort is only found in me guaranteeing you'll never have a problem ever again in your life, I'm a liar. But if comfort says, I can give you a resource and I can give you a relationship with someone who will help you walk through any difficulty you'll ever go through, that's comfort. Because I can't guarantee we'll never suffer another pandemic, another tornado, that my family member won't be diagnosed with cancer tomorrow. But I can guarantee that God is there to walk with me. So my greatest comfort, my greatest source of comfort, is knowing who's walking with me. Not necessarily that I'm avoiding any of the difficulties. Yang 我很喜欢一句话叫兄弟爬山各自努力比如说那些病人都要跑四五家医院斗殴的情况这如果真的是一场生物化2020 ended as bad as it started. It's really easy to get isolated and to feel like what you have going on is the only thing that matters. And it's not. Like at the end of the day, I think the thing that I've taken away the most from COVID is that everything we have is precious. Every moment is. And that if we can help other people, we should. Because 
tomorrow is not promised. And what we have with each other and our families and the experiences that we can have with those people are what is most important because it doesn't matter how old you are, how young you are, what else you have going on with your health, health or your life or your lifestyle. Like it can all be over in a moment. And that's something that you should never take for granted. One of the things I love about scripture is that the Bible does not record all the good side of life. Scripture talks about places where people made mistakes and they made choices and they suffered the consequences of it. From the very beginning of time, Adam and Eve, from the standpoint of having everything at their disposal, every good thing was available to them, and yet they still had a choice. The beautiful thing about choice is that I have a choice as to who I will love and what I will love. And that's why God created us, was not to be automatronic robots. He wanted us to know we had a choice. All throughout Scripture, out through time and history, you could look at it, that there are always going to be destructive events. One of the greatest examples, I think, is Job. And I, I look to that passage quite a bit during this whole event because there were tornadoes. Uh, there were destructive forces. Uh, there's been pandemics in the past. Scripture records it. There have been famines, and there has been a lot of natural disasters, as well as disasters brought about by regimes in power wanting to dominate and to conquer and to destroy. In all of those cases, it is interesting that the ones that were there as the, the police force, those that were the, the champions of good, the, the upholders of righteousness, the good in society, the ones that God had instructed to go into regions and to assert authority again, were there because of the fact that the nations that they were going up against had abused, had killed their own children, had offered them to unbelievable gods, and had demanded things that were truly vile and destructive. And I always look at it in the sense that God, in consistently managing history, has always sought to have a group of people that could just point to truth, show you truth. There is a way that is better. And it has to do with information and revelation that God gives as to how to better manage our resources. You talk about climate control. God has a plan for us being good stewards of the earth. Talk about management of our political sphere. God has a way that doesn't always mean a theocracy. theocracy. He used kingdoms and authorities and powers to wield justice that had no desire for Him whatsoever. But God used those people to enact justice upon other nations that were abusing other nations. Every time you bring God into the equation, you find hope and you find truth. You find something stable, reliable, consistent, faithful, enduring. But when you take God out of the equation, you find man. And we're flighty, and we're fickle, and we're whimsical, and we're this way today, and we woke up on the wrong side of the bed tomorrow, and we're different. But with God, He's consistent, and He's the same. So the greatest example of crisis is a cross. Because here comes a guy that did absolutely nothing wrong. He just pointed people to see love and compassion and forgiveness. And people got jealous, and people hated him for it, and they crucified him, literally, put him on a cross. He didn't deserve it, he wasn't worthy of it, but he still endured it. And he doesn't revile them. He doesn't attack them. He still says, I hope they'll get the message one day. I hope they'll understand. And he did that because of his compassion for us, a love for us. If I want to know what love really looks like, it's a cross. It's a sacrifice to which he was willing to go for me. So let a tornado come, and it takes everything from my life, but I still have my soul. Well, and I have my family. But what if I lose a family member? Well, my greatest hope is that I'll see them again. There is an eternal destination. So my greatest hope for people in watching something like this is that they'll come and check up their life a little bit. Stop short and recognize if everything is taken away from you, what then do you really have? If it was that easily removed from your life, what have you been living for if it's that quickly able to be destroyed and taken away? 
what are you really after is the purpose of living. If a tornado can wipe it out, or a hospital bed in COVID could completely remove it, then what is the meaning and the purpose of your life if it's that easily removed from the equation? Everything about my existence, everything about me, if, if I am uh, that fragile, and yet I'm trusting in my fragileness to give me everything that I need, then that's not a lot of hope. And that's what God comes in to remind us of, is, is that I'm greater than you. I made you. I created you. And so there are circumstances that are tough, and there are difficult days. Well, that's just the nature of the fact that it got broken pretty quickly. And that was due to a choice that was made by us, not him. And he put us into a situation now to rely upon him and to trust him and to let him lead us then through the rest of this life. It's been a privilege and an honor to work with this great group of people. Our families are at home. Uh, we didn't know what we had in front of us. You can't see it. And uh, with, with a lot of good people, like I said, there's 34 men and women and they got behind us. They listened, they learned, and we all adapted. We evolved faster than the virus. And, and now we get to go home. Hurting, broken, we allow ourselves to be torn down and reshaped, rebuilt based on the foundations of faith, reborn stronger as a community, serving one another. When disaster brings us the worst in our world, it brings out the best in our communities. Through the fear and tragedy that our world has suffered, mankind can push for a better future. We will heal within our homes and our families, but also in our strengthened community. Though many trials may be left to face, we build upon our history to overcome them. Our strength is in our kindness to one another and in our courage to face our fears. Life on Earth will be forever changed as we stand together, united and equal against an invisible enemy. <laughs>